I remember hearing about a dad who said that before he got married and had any kids, he had eight great theories on how to raise kids. And he said, now that I've been married for a while, I have eight kids, but I don't have any remaining theories on how to raise them. So parenting, it's a bit tough. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. Now, I know with a lot of our podcasts, we focus on young people and dating life and singles and all that stuff, but I thought it'd be good to pivot uh, for the married couples out there, for parents, on how to transmit this message of chastity effectively to our kids on a daily basis. How do we do this? Because right now, you parents, mom and dads, like you are on a frontier of parenthood. No parents have ever been at before. Because honestly, raising a kid in the year 1700 was probably pretty much the same thing as raising a kid in the year 700. But raising a kid nowadays, man, it is nothing like it was just 20 years ago. The game has changed. I remember speaking at a high school a while back in Texas, and there were 87 girls pregnant on campus. Uh, one of the girls, and that didn't include the junior high, brought the number of pregnancies over 100. But one of the girls we met uh, was seven months pregnant. She just told her parents the news. They didn't know she was expecting. Apparently, she was avoiding them a lot. And now they know that she's preggers. Uh, she didn't know how to tell them the full story. Okay. Full story is that her boyfriend, you ready for this, lives in her closet. That's right. Her boyfriend's been living in her closet for more than a year. She brings him up leftovers after dinner. He hops out the window to hang out with friends. And this has been going on for the year, a year. And the parents had no idea. And so, I mean, the moral of the story is uh, when you get done with the podcast, you know, uh, check your kids' closets. But no, I'm sure things are going better at your place. But there's this unbelievable, just like, just breakdown in the family. We've got this epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases, uh, the most common of which is called HPV, human papillomavirus. It's killed more women than AIDS has because it can cause cervical cancer. We've got epidemic of pornography going on right now, and it's hard to keep up with this stuff. And with the kids, they say the average age at which a boy is first exposed to internet porn is between nine and 11 years old. And unfortunately, it's not just the boys either. One girl wrote me this long letter and she said, you know, I was really addicted to hardcore pornography for many years. And then she said, I finally broke free and I haven't looked at it for two years now. And she said, I'm hoping I can stay strong because next year I'm going to be going to high school and I know it's going to be even more difficult there. It's like, my goodness, if this is the young girl's exposure to human sexuality when she's in elementary school, my goodness. I mean, these kids are getting bombarded. And what's scary is what happens a couple of years later. In fact, I remember seeing an interview with a, uh, a woman, I guess she was like some type of pediatric nurse helping kids who are survivors of sexual abuse. And she said, you know, what we're seeing the number one perpetrator of sexual abuse is not some cohabiting boyfriend. It's not the clergy. It's not some pervert down the street. They said, no, the number one perpetrator that we're finding of sexual abuse against children is 11 to 15 year old boys who've been exposed to pornography. They see it on their cell phones and then their little sister has a slumber party with a cousin or a friend, parents aren't around and things happen and they never get reported. And so the bad news, I mean, it's rough. It's scary. The confusion on what it even means to be human and male and female. And a lot of parents are just like, my goodness, like, isn't everything going to hell in a handbasket? Like, is there really any hope? How are we going to get through this whole thing? A lot of parents, I just kind of give up sometimes. Just people in general give up on the young people. I remember speaking at an all boys high school down south once, and it was a 1,000, I think like 200 boys. And before the assembly, the uh, administrator came to me and he said, you're going to speak to these boys today? I said, yes. He said, about chastity? I said, yes. He said, son, I'd rather speak to the leaders of the Ku Klux Klan on interracial marriage than to these boys on chastity. And I thanked him for his vote of confidence, but I don't think he understood the most common standing ovation we get from audiences is the all boys high schools. They're hungry for this message. People want it. In fact, I was invited once to speak at a Loyola University down in Louisiana to do a debate. They wanted me to do a debate on campus with a doctor from the University of New Orleans who is a doctor of sexology. Now, don't ask me where you get the degree in that, but he had one. And he and I were to debate the merits of abstinence versus safe sex education. So we did that in front of all the college students. And when the debate had ended, the moderator told the students, now, if you guys want to learn more about uh, safe sex, you can put your name and information on that sheet over there. And if you want to learn more about chastity, well, then you can put your contact information on that paper over there on the way out. 
The debate ended, and the other debater and I exchanged pleasantries, and then we went to the back of the room after all the students had left, and uh, the safe sex sheet, not one student put their name down for more information on that topic. But the chastity sheet was actually signed front and back with young people who had never heard this message before when they were probably getting condoms at freshman orientation and being told to be responsible with their drinks so they don't get date raped. They wanted a more substantial message. They wanted this. And so young people longed for this because I think our hearts are made for love. Our minds are made for the truth. And chastity offers us both of those things. And the fact is, as much bad news as you see in the media, man, there's a lot of good news. In fact, Centers for Disease Control has been tracking the sexual activity rates of young people for more than about 30 years. So about 1991, what they started coming out with was these youth risk behavior surveillance surveys. Okay, so the YRBS study. And every two years it comes out showing their alcohol use and drug use and how many ride a bike without a helmet, and all kinds of stuff like that. And it covers their sexual activity as well. And what's interesting is what they've discovered is the sexual activity rate of American high school students for 30 years has been constantly going down. The majority of American high school students are virgins. And right now it's 27% are currently sexually active. I think it's 38% have ever had sex, meaning most high school students in the country are virgins. They're, they're choosing this. And those who are not virgins, I found remarkably open to chastity because the studies show that most high school students who have had sex privately admit they wish they waited longer. It was kind of a disappointment. I find they're open to this mess of chastity because what chastity does is it frees you not only to love, it frees you to know if you're being loved. Uh, one perfect example of this, I was a speaking at a public high school in Texas and a girl came up dating this guy treats her like garbage. I said, sweetheart, you deserve a lot better than him. Just break up. And she said, well, I can't break up with him. I mean, I've given him everything, my virginity, my reputation. I just can't let go of it all. I said, I know it's tough, but look, tell him no more sex. Watch what happens. She said, okay, I do that. Took off her necklace and she gave it to me. She said, he makes me wear this. He's really possessive. I said, okay, I'll throw it away for you. And she left. Five minutes later, she comes back happy as can be. She said, I dumped him. I said, that was quick. She said, yep. I told him no more sex. He slammed his locker. He threw a book at me. He said, where's your necklace? She said, I gave it to the chastity guy. And you see what happens. Like, dude, she tested his love. Like, do you love me? Do you want me? Or do you just want the pleasure you're getting from me? And so this virtue of chastity liberated her to be loved and realized that she was simply being used. So how do we bring this message to the kids? I mean, first people say, well, if you want your kid to save sex for marriage, well, you got to send them to that Catholic school. And if that doesn't work, send them to the Catholic youth group. If that doesn't work, then send them to the Catholic correctional facility. And if that doesn't work, then you need to pray and pray hard. Upside down. We got to be convinced that our most important role for our kids is the interior life of prayer not just praying for our kids, but pursuing God ourselves, because I will not be a better father to my sons than I am a son to the father. In fact, it was John Paul II who said that his home was his first seminary, even though his dad never talked to him about the priesthood. He said, you know, his, his, you may know his story. His sister died, brother died, mom died. All that was left was his father and him. And he said, sometimes at night, I would wake up and I'd go in my father's room and I'd see my dad kneeling in the dark on his floor, just lost in prayer. Because he said, after my mother's death, my father's life became one of constant prayer. And he learned from that. Look, men pray. Make, men take their interior lives seriously. And so you might think, well, look, I pray for my kid. Good. Grace before meals, Sunday mass. Go further. Go to confession at least once a month as a family. Because for one, it's a great time to examine your conscience. Because if you don't think you've sinned a lot that month, Dan, you got four people standing next to you in line that will give you a litany of your imperfections for the last 30 days without missing one of them. It's also great for them to see you in line for confession because in a teenage brain, it's like, ooh, even dad has to tell his father he's sorry. Even mom has to tell her mother the church she's sorry. They need the sacraments too. It's not something we're just getting spoon fed in religion class. They got to see it with their own eyes. And as much junk as there is on the internet, there's also a lot of good stuff out there to help us to pray. One thing that I always like to promote, a uh, hollow. Hollow is an app. It's you can try this thing for free for 14 days. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, you, you can just go to hollow.com slash lust is boring. Try it for free 14 days. 
And this is great stuff that you can use. Driving to school with the kids, click on the app. You can pray the rosary out loud. You can do some morning prayer, liturgy, the hours, listen to some great homilies on a road trip. All that stuff is at Hollow. You can try it out for 14 days for free. Kids having trouble falling asleep. They got little sleep stories, prayers. I mean, it's awesome stuff. And so check that out. Hollow.com slash lust is boring. Try it out for 14 days. And you might think, look, Jason, but we've been doing the prayer thing. We've been going to mass and adoration, but my kid's not listening. And now he's living with his girlfriend and, you know, and he doesn't want to go to church on Sundays. And then you start beating yourself up. I shouldn't have done this. I did that wrong. I shouldn't have done. This. Don't be so hard on yourself. Look, who's the best parent in the heavenly, in, in, in the universe, it's the heavenly father. Now look at how messed up all of his kids are down here. Okay. It's not because he's a defective dad. His kids have free will and they do dumb things just like ours and us. And so don't be too hard on yourself. God's going to answer your prayers for your kid. I really think he will. I know he will. You might not see the fruit of it yet, but the fruit of prayer is often not experienced in prayer, rather by perseverance in prayer. Imagine your prayer welling up like water behind a dam. That dam is your kid's free will. I don't want religion shoved down my throat. I'm telling the years, the weight of the grace of those prayers, one day the dam's going to split. All that grace is going to come flowing into their lives. Might not happen tonight, might not ha happen till their deathbed, but those graces are going to be applied. But not just to pray for your kid, fast for them. Because to pray without fasting is like boxing with an arm tied behind your back. Your half is effective. And it doesn't have to be bread and water from morning till night. You could Skip a meal, skip snacks between meals, you know, fast from internet, like just do some type of fast. But, you know, it's best with food to get your body to pray with your soul and offer that up. And speaking of offering it up, offer up your sufferings for your kid. If you're raised in a Catholic home, you remember Catholic grade school, you remember the nuns telling you, you don't like that, offer it up. You don't like this, offer it up. It's like, what does that mean? Like, it sounds like you're telling me to shut up in a religious way. And it's pretty much that. But the theology is, is deeper. It comes from St. Paul, who said, I rejoice in my sufferings, because in my body I make up what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of this church. It sounds kind of weird. Paul's like making up what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Well, what he's getting at is that Jesus didn't suffer, so we wouldn't have to suffer. He suffered so we would know how to suffer. Because in becoming man, Christ redeemed everything human, human love, human labor, human suffering. Everything now takes on a supernatural weight to it. And so if you suffer with him, you can actually participate in the distribution of the graces of Calvary that Christ earned once and for all for mankind, that you can enter into that. Because the church is the body of Christ. This isn't some little religious metaphor. The Catholic Church is the extension of the person of Jesus Christ through time, space, and history. He continues his work of redemption in his suffering body, which is your cancer, your unemployment, your alcoholic spouse, your difficult kid. Every form of human suffering, when joined to the cross, takes on the very power of the cross. And this applies in a particular way, I think, to you moms, because the, the union you have with your kids, it's not just, the bond isn't just like emotional. It's deeply biological. In fact, when I was in college, I took a class on embryology. The professor explained that you can take blood out of a pregnant mom, sift through her blood cells, and find the blood cells of her unborn baby living in her bloodstream. It's called fetal microchimerism. They pass through the placental arrangement, they enter into the woman's bloodstream, and they live and replicate there. The opposite is also true maternal microchimerism, where the blood cells of the mother live on in the bodies of the children. But what's fascinating with the fetal microchimerism is that they found when you take blood from an expectant mom, you will not only find the blood cells of the baby that are the baby's inner, you will actually find the living blood cells of the children that that woman has conceived or given birth to from 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, still living and replicating in the body of the woman. Immunologists have noticed that if you look at diseased tissue within a woman who's had multiple pregnancies, you will find her white blood cells fighting that infection along with the white blood cells of every single child in her family, also aiding mom's immune system in fighting that infection. And so these blood cells live on indefinitely throughout the body of the woman, in her brain, in her heart. And like for families like ours that have suffered miscarriage, it's such a tremendous consolation to know that the life of that child, who now stands before the very throne of God, 
is still literally, in a way, living in the heart of the family, in the heart of the mother. And so this beautiful union of bodies between the mother and the child bespeaks a tremendous unity of your hearts uh, that indicates that your suffering can be unique and unique in its value. And this great union, I don't know if it explains maternal intuition. I mean, my wife's got that. Like, like sometimes she'll wake up in the middle of the night, she's like, oh, Jason, the baby's about to wake up. And I'm like, what? And then like a minute later, the baby wakes up. I'm like, dude, how can you do that? Like, you can hear him before he cries, and I can't even hear him after he is crying. Like, this is remarkable stuff. But this great union of hearts maybe says something that your suffering is unique too. But if you know what to do with that suffering, to offer that up as a prayer for your child's conversion, for their future vocation, then harnessing that power of redemptive suffering, joining that with fasting and prayer constitutes the greatest force of human history. That's the first and foundational point of prayer. Second thing, want your kids to be abstinent, set the standard high and clear. Abstinence until marriage. Not, I want you to be abstinent, but if you're going to do it anyway, at least use a condom. Oh, come on, man. People say, well, that's realistic. Kids are going to do it anyway. Ah, that's pessimistic. That's telling your kid you expect they're going to fail. And you don't give them that message with like drinking and drugs now. Don't drink and drive. But if you're going to drink and drive, drive in the slow lane on the way home from the party. Accidents aren't as bad if you're only going 45. Nuh uh You give them a message of risk avoidance. And besides, the whole message of safe sex is so degrading to women because it reduces a woman to her genitals. Because as long as she's not pregnant and as long as she didn't get herpes, she's safe. Huh, really? How come she's bawling her eyes out after some broken sexual relationship? They used a condom. She's safe, protected, and responsible. Uh -uh. Sex is not a biological act. It's a human act. It involves the heart, the soul, the family, the future. And to give a kid a piece of plastic and tell them now they're safe, responsible, and protected is such a false sense of security. And telling a kid like, well, you might not want to do it right now. Wait until you're ready. Wait until you find the right person for you. It's way too vague. Kids need, th they think in black and white. It's abstinence until marriage. That's black and white. Because it was, a, what, Dr. Phil had a TV show on teens and sexual stuff. Most of the show is pretty good advice. At the end, it was years ago, I just remember he said, now what we learned today is you should not be engaging in this behavior until you're mature and you are ready. I'm like, dude, don't do it until you're mature. I don't know about you, but when I was 15 years old, I had never been more mature in my entire life as I was at that moment. I was maturing by the hour. And so tell a kid don't do it till they're mature is basically a green light. The part of the brain in a teen that's in charge of critical thinking is not fully mature until they're about 24, 25 years old. That's why they need us to step in to speak loud, high, and clear abstinence until marriage. Third thing I'd say, be their parent first and not just their buddy because your kids have an abundance of buddies, but they only have one set of parents. And so if you have strict rules and guidelines, you're actually giving them permission to blame you for why they can't be stupid. So if they're at a party and someone pulls out the drugs, like, oh, I can't smoke that. My mom would kill me if she smelled weed on me when I got home. They can blame you for why they can't be dumb. Remember one girl pulled out her cell phone. Her boyfriend said, you know, hey, I think it's time for us to take our relationship to the next level because we've been together for like three weeks now and everything. And she said, oh, I know. And she says, here's my daddy's phone number. Give him a call. If he says I can do this with you tonight, then I'm ready to go. <laughs> Boyfriend's like, I don't want to use up all your cell phone data there, sweetheart. And that girl knew my dad's got my back on this one. And she knew that because her father spoke to her about this stuff. He wasn't some passive dad. He intervened. He spoke to her about this stuff. And so we need to intervene. And are they going to like all the rules? No, but that's okay. I mean, we've got to have a little bit of indifference there, right? I remember seeing a video of a mom on Facebook or something, and she's sitting there in her kitchen. She's got like a bucket of ice cream that she's eating out of and got a glass of wine. And she says, you know what? All my kids are mad at me right now for the exact same reason. She said, you know why they're mad at me? Because I parented them. But she said, I don't care if you're mad at me. It's not my job to be liked by some adolescent child. She said, it's my job to raise you in such a way that I would actually want to hang out with you when you get old enough. And so if you don't like my rules, I'm okay with that. She starts eating the ice cream. She said, if you get mad, I can live with that. She starts drinking the wine. She starts putting the wine in the ice cream and scooping that out. But I, she's got this like bold indifference. Like, look, you don't have to like my rules. In fact, if you liked all of my rules, I'd probably be a horribly neglectful parent. It's like flying a kite. 
If you want it to go up, you don't run with the kite. You got to hold back. And it's precisely the tension that allows it to reach its potential. Same thing with raising the kids. Point number four, delay the onset of dating. There is no point of dating in high school. And I base that premise on the fact that I've spoken to more than 2 million of them on six continents for the last 20 years. And the happiest ones I've met are the ones who told me that. I don't see any point of dating in high school. Even if I meet a great girl, who cares? She's going to UCLA next year and I'm going to LSU. What are we going to have? A long distance, four-year relationship while she's meeting 30,000 college guys? And the studies will show this. They surveyed 800 students in high school and asked them, when did you start dating and are you still a virgin? Here's they found. Students who started dating in the seventh grade or younger, more than 90% of the girls and 70% of the boys had lost their virginity by the middle of high school. Whereas students who started dating at the age of 16 or older, more than 80% of them were still virgins in the middle of high school. There's tremendous wisdom in delaying the onset of dating and keeping the younger girls away from older boys who don't have enough social skills to date a girl their own age. And the girl thinks, oh, but mom, he's so mature. He's as mature as you think he is. He'd probably be dating girls his own age instead of climbing down the social ladder by three years. And so, but it isn't enough to condemn dating. We have to teach them how to date and when to date. They need to know how to date. We can't skip this over and explaining them that dating is like getting on a freeway. It's a road with only two exits though, breakup and marriage. And if that's the reality of dating, what's the point of committing to anybody unless you can see yourself with that person for good, which means no missionary dating. Dating someone hoping they can fix them and change them and rehabilitate them or whatever. No, we've got to make it clear. The purpose of dating is that you commit to someone hoping they're going to stay the way they are for good. But if you really want to know why kids today don't know how to date, it's pretty much our fault, right? Is the married couples and parents because we forgot how to date. In fact, a buddy of mine, he's been married for ah, about 20 years and he and his wife in 20 years have never once missed their weekly date night in 20 years years. Rain or shine, he takes her on a date. And it doesn't matter. Even if the kids are sick in the living room, like thrown up in buckets, like who cares? Like they'll drug them out with some Benadryl or whatever. And, you know, have a date at midnight in the kitchen or whatever. They'll, they're going to make the time for each other. And I'm telling you, man, that, that guy's kids are going to know how to date because they just watched dating. And so it needs to start at home for the kids to pick that up instead of just blaming it on the culture at large. Now, point number five, uh, form a solid parent network, find other good parents. It isn't just good for some fellowship. So important for your kids to have friends who have parents who have the same values you do. So they see they're not the only kid in the galaxy with a curfew, but you also pick up good strategies. I remember one dad told me, he said, what I do to keep my boy in line is my house is the cool house. I got a basketball court out front. I got a swimming pool out back. In my basement, I've got Xbox, PlayStation, you name it. And I got frozen pizzas and monster energy drinks stacked up in the fridge. He said, I have everything a teenage boy could want on my property. He said, so where do you think my boys and all their little friends <clears throat> want to be every day of the week? My house. He said, so I don't have to worry about my kid being down the street at some other guy's house. You know, his friend finding his friend's dad's porn collection because the dad doesn't get home to work till six at night because the boys want to be at my house. So you just pick up these good strategies about being around other good parents. Point number six, internet and media safety. This is huge. Look, if you give your kid a cell phone and you don't put some type of filter on that thing, you just handed your kid like a billion X-rated bookstores in his pocket and told him to behave himself. Good luck with that. This thing needs some serious parameters on it. And you got to get computer literate, parents. I mean, I love you, but God bless you. Like some of you don't even know how to open an email attachment and your kid is like hacking into the Pentagon's website for fun after school. Like, let's catch up. So how do you make this thing safe, right? It's not like you can forbid cell phone use until they're 18 and they leave your house and it's their first exposure to it. We have to train them how to use it responsibly. And so what I recommend is a couple things. One, if you get your cell phone now and you text the word SAFE, S-A-F-E, to the phone number 66866. So just get out your cell phone right now, pull that out, text 66866, and then write the word SAFE and click send. You'll get an email right back or text right back saying, hey, what's your email? We'll sign you up for this thing. You send in your email and they will send you for the next seven days 
a free video. It's like three or four minutes long each. Each day will explain to you how to set up security on all the devices in your home. Because it's like when it comes to internet safety, your family is living in a very bad neighborhood, digitally speaking. You could lock the front door, but a burglar can come out the back. So then you can lock the back door. Well, then he's crawling through the window. Okay, seal up the windows. Dude, now he's coming down the chimney. Now he's up through the basement. There's so many portals of entry that we have to seal off. And as busy parents, you don't have the time to figure out, okay, well, how do I get on Snapchat and TikTok and set privacy set? Like, there's too much. And so this nice little thing, seven days, it's free. You're not going to get a lifetime of spam. It's just seven days of little quick videos put together to explain internet and media safety. And one of the most important things they'll point out to you is you should get Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes is an internet screen-based accountability software that not only blocks porn on all the devices in your home, it'll send you a report every single morning of all the websites everybody's looking at and if there's any things you need to be made known of. And so it's so important because it's not just like an HTML-based internet filter where it's just going to block some bad, dirty website. It will actually recognize porn when it appears, if it tries to appear on the screen, whether through a text message, an app, or anything, it'll catch it, block it, and send you the report. And so when you install this on your families, and if you want to try this thing for free for a month, you just go to chastity.com, or no, not chastity.com, you go to covenanteyes.com, and then you type in the word chastity as a promo code at, at covenanteyes.com. And I'll put the link in the show notes. You can try this thing for free for a month. And to me, it's non-negotiable. You got to get this in the family because we've got it on all our you know, computers. In fact, we just got some new iPads. Got to put it on that now. Um, but get this thing and don't tell your kid now. We're going to know what you're looking at. You, what you tell them is like, hey, we're going to put this on everybody's computer in the house so you can know what websites dad's looking at and dad can know what websites you're looking at and your little sister can know what websites mom's looking at. Because we're going to hold each other accountable as a family to the principles of the gospel. So it's not us spying on you. It's, hey, we are all in this together. Because if they get exposed to that junk early on, I mean, I've had girls tell me when they're like 15 years old that they want to have like an asexual marriage when they get older, like an abstinent celibate marriage. And I'm like, you talk to these girls, like, well, where's this really coming from? Because they want companionship, they want love, but they don't want the sexual... And it turns out like all they've ever seen of sexual intimacy is what they saw on the phones. And if that porn is what sex is, they want nothing to do with it. And so it's not enough though to protect the kids from porn. We got to save the family from porn. We save the marriage from porn. You know, I remember what meet one wife, wife, she told me that she and her husband got separated after the divorce. She lifted up her husband's side of the bed. She's changing the sheets. And uh, under there was a stack of like Maxim men's soft core porn magazines. She said, no wonder we struggled so much with intimacy. I mean, the very moment he's supposed to be making love to me, he's using my body to lust after these women and his imagination. You know, no matter we struggle with so much with intimacy, the very moment he's supposed to be renewing his wedding vows in the flesh, he's committing adultery in his heart. And so covenant eyes, whether it's the mom, the dad, whoever's struggling with porn, this is going to hold us all accountable. Challenges, though, the kids aren't just looking at the porn. Kids are becoming the porn. Because what will happen is the boy will text the girl, hey, why don't you take off some clothes and send me a picture of yourself? And the girl's like, oh, okay, I'm dumb. I'll do that. And then sends him the picture, tells him, don't show that to anybody. And he's like, oh, I won't show anyone for three minutes. And then everybody on the football team's got a copy of it and they share it with their friends. And the girl commits suicide. This is happening all over the country. And so what we got to explain to the girls, like, look, when you click send, you've just like <laughs> given away the rights to that image. That could be stuck on the internet for 20 years. And if you're the guy who gets it, you're in possession of child porn. If you send that to a friend, you've now distributed child porn. I know of a guy lost his full ride scholarship to play football at a university for doing this on a cell phone. And so this thing needs serious parameters. It should go to bed at night in your room, parents, on your nightstand, not theirs. No reason on earth some seventh grade girl needs an iPhone 27 or whatever they're up to now, scrolling through Instagram and Snapchat till two o'clock in the morning, looking at everybody's perfect hair and perfect body and perfect relationship, and then going to bed feeling less than all of that. They don't need that. Give this thing a curfew, nine o'clock at night, goes to bed in your room, end of discussion. Next point. If you really want your kid to listen to your advice, make sure to ask them the right questions instead of thinking of how to give them a perfect lecture. For example, one girl told me, Jason, I'm thinking of giving away my virginity. 
And I said, okay, well, why? And she said, I don't know. I go, no, really, why do you want to give that to that guy? And she said, I want to feel wanted. I said, that's a very honest answer. I said, do you think he wants you? And she's like, oh, I know he wants me. I'm like, no, no, no. Do you think he really wants you? She said, no. I go, what do you think he really wants? She said, he just wants sex. I go, is that what you want? She's like, no, I'm going to break up with him tomorrow. I'm going to send him a text message right now. I'm like, you go, girl. I didn't tell her to do any of that. I just asked her the right questions and she owned it. It's like when the Columbine shootings happened a while back. Um, I remember one guy was asked, if you could tell those teenage murderers anything, what would you have told them? And one guy said, look, I wouldn't tell them anything. I'd listen to them because that's the one thing apparently nobody bothered to do. The power of just listening. Point number eight, don't just give your kid the talk. Give them thousands of them. Parents are always asking me, when do I give my kid the talk? Like it's some chastity bomb you drop on your kid. It's going to inoculate him from lust forever. It, it, no, huh? it's not about giving a talk. It's about a lifelong conversation. And obviously the birds and the bees talk. You don't have that a thousand times. And could it be a little bit awkward at first? Yeah, you know, it could. It might not go over great. That's fine. This is a long-term discussion you're going to be having. And it doesn't always go over well. I remember a friend of mine told his kids how babies are made and the kid is just grossed out. And he's like, dad, ugh, how long have people been doing this? I said, tell them the 1960s. And he said, dad, is there any other way? That's like, that's pretty much it, son. And then apparently later the daughter comes to dad, this little girl and said, daddy, I want to be like the blessed Virgin Mary. And the dad said, oh, that's great. She said, yeah, daddy, I want to get pregnant before I'm married. And the dad's like, uh, no, 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 no. That, that's not the lesson to be learned there. And so it, it could be a little clunky, but that's okay. The awkwardness is part of the authenticity. Start early, not necessarily the birds and the bees, because the church will never give you an age to have that type of facts of life talk because there's, there's no age really, because every kid is different. This is why the parents are the primary sex educators, not the school, the government, or the state. Every kid develops differently. Their period of latency of innocence should be preserved for as long as possible. But the key is finding that window before the world really breaks in where we can give them the message first. And so start young. And, you know, every kid is going to be different. Some are going to be very precocious, right? I mean, some of you might have a 13-year-old kid and you couldn't even care less where babies come from. And then along comes like your nine-year-old and be like, mom, how did the baby get in your belly? And oh, God put the baby in. Oh, look, I know God put the baby in the belly, but how did God put the baby in the belly? You know, like they're just precocious and they want answers sooner. Every kid is different. And so one thing that you can do, start with little books like The Princess and the Kiss or The Squire and the Scroll. These are little storybooks you can read to little kids. And we've got them at chastity.com. It doesn't go into the birds and the bees, but introduces them to the message of chastity, of the gift of purity, that your body is good, that your gender is good, that introducing them to that, that the body isn't dirty, there's no bad body parts, the, the right understanding of the body. That way, when it comes time for the birds and the bees, there's a, there's, you know, a foundation to that theologically. And then likewise, as they get older, they're going to have some serious questions. Like, oh, why can't I live with my girlfriend? Why can't we do that? We got to be able to give them solid answers. And so at chastity.com, you're going to find tons of resources and answers that parents can use to foster this lifelong conversation. And speaking of the conversation, I'd say tip number nine, do just get over your insecurities when it comes to talk about this stuff. A lot of parents are scared to death. Well, what if my kid says, dad, were you a virgin? You know, how far did you and mom go? And a lot of parents think I wasn't some spotless virgin on my wedding night. Aren't I going to look like a hypocrite? Look, if you've sinned and you've repented, you're not a hypocrite. If you've sinned and you've not repented, you should probably stay quiet because kids are excellent at spotting a fake. But if you made mistakes, don't allow yourself to be muzzled because you don't have a perfect past. Your authority does not come from your perfection. It comes from your parenthood, and that was given to you by God. Your past is your personal business. Your kid doesn't have a right to that information. If you think disclosing some of that could be helpful to them, that's up to you and your spouse's discretion. You could maybe say something like, hey, you know, I made some mistakes growing up, and the reason I believe so firmly in chastity now is because I just kind of learned the hard way, you know, how much suffering it causes unnecessarily when you don't trust God with your body. And so you could leave it vague, trusting that any information you disclose could possibly trickle down to the younger ears in the family so you need some prudence there, obviously, but don't let yourself be muzzled. And also, don't dump it on the mom. A lot of times, the whole birds, the bees, and chastity thing, oh, well, you're the mom, you're the religious, ethical, spiritual person in the family, you deal with that stuff. And 
mom's like, well, you're the dad. You need to talk to him about girls. Okay, we'll go fishing. And they get out in the boat. And son, do you have any questions about girls? No. Okay, we're done with that then. Let's catch some bass. It isn't going to work because if mom harps on religion and morality and spirituality, but dad is quiet, kids will assume that dad disagrees with mom, but he's just being respectful because wink, wink, you know, dad, boys are going to be boys. Father must speak. If you're a single parent and you think, well, I don't have a good husband around, you have a certain advantage of sorts that you're not asking your kid to live a lifestyle that you as a single parent are not embracing as well. The, the, to be pure, to be holy, the standard of innocence for a seven-year-old is no different than it should be for a 37-year-old to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. Which leads us to the 10th point and the most important one, that if you really want your kid to embrace the virtue of chastity, you better be willing to practice it yourself. All of the virtues are more easily caught than taught. If you want your kid to be humble, you can't give him a humility speech. Gotta be humble. Same thing with chastity. Don't expect your kids to obey the church's teachings on sex before marriage if you refuse to obey the church's teachings on sex inside of marriage, which includes chastity in marriage. Now, that does not mean abstinence. People get the words confused. You know, one mom came to me and she said, I was coming to your talk tonight. And my husband said, where are you going tonight? And she said, oh, I'm going to the chastity talk. And he looked at her and he said, well, don't get any ideas while you're there. It's like, no, it doesn't mean abstinence. It means you use the gift of sex according to God's plan for your life. And so what that means is not only no pornography and infidelity, it also means no contraception in marriage and sterilization. And some couples are like, oh, look, you had me up until there. But I mean, seriously, what are we supposed to have? 10 kids, 15 kids, be the next Duggars, have a Catholic reality show. We can't afford that financially, let alone emotionally. I mean, what are we supposed to use? The calendar rhythm method? Yeah, I mean, look, my parents tried that. It didn't work, and here I am. So that's a pretty good deal for me. But if my wife and I want to plan how many kids we have, we listen to the church and use natural family planning. It's more than 99% effective with no side effects. Unfortunately, a lot of young couples don't really know much about this, other than their gynecologist confusing it with the calendar rhythm method and telling them it doesn't work and to think of other options. In fact, I give talks to engaged couples. And I remember giving one in San Diego in the diocese. They gave him the survey, see what they knew about NFP beforehand. And this one 26-year-old woman wrote, they asked her, in one sentence, define natural family planning. She said, oh, that's a way to have sex that meets church requirements. Now, doesn't that sound like fun? But that's literally all she knew. Oh, that's that Vatican roulette thing. Oh, that doesn't work. No, it is effective. And couples who use it have a divorce rate under 4%. And so look, your kids are not always going to obey you, but they'll never fail to imitate you. So embrace this virtue of chastity in your own lives and marriages. One way to do this for the dads, Matt, Fred, and I are just about to release. It's already at the printer. It's coming back in like two weeks, a book and a program called Forged for Guys. Fathers can do this with sons. I already asked the printer, send me a copy overnight. Soon it gets off. I want to start it with my boys. And so what this is, is a 33-day program in a booklet that you can do with the kids. It's just a short reading each day that's going to dive into a different element of battling lust, to basically defend love from lust in all its forms, whether it's porn, masturbation, hooking up with a girlfriend, lust in your marriage. And it, it, it one day at a time goes through this. And with each day, we're going to send you a free video on your phone or email from a different presenter. We've got speaking myself and Matt Fred, Father Mike Schmitz, uh, Father Jacques Philippe. We've got Chris Stefanik. Like every day, Sister Miriam James. And I mean, so many amazing presenters every day are just going to shoot you a little three minute video. On day number four, it's called Lift Up Your Hearts. And we have a video that comprises, and this one's the long one, it's like nine minutes long, but we have 38 young adult women who have contributed little 10 to 15 second clips of how awesome they think it is that you're embarking in this virtue of chastity and how that sets you a cut above the other guys in the culture that are being, being won over by their lust instead of conquering it for the sake of others. And so it's an amazing little booklet. And right now you want to pre-order it. Uh, you will send you the second copy for free. Uh, you can just click the link in the show notes or go to chastity.com. And we've got the book there. It's called Forge. We're shipping this thing in mid to late November uh, from the printer to the warehouse. And then we're going to get it out the door. And so please pray for everybody who does this. And dads, maybe you'd be listening or moms, 
get this thing for dad and the son. Or you can do it as two high school guys together, guys in the dorm, men can listen to it together, uh, watch the videos and do the book. So the thing is called Forge. Super pumped to get it out there. But in the end, we've got to embrace this virtue ourselves because then the kids see the big picture. That this isn't about waiting until marriage so they get a piece of paper so sex is now legal for them. No, it's about waiting for a person. It's about waiting for this sacrament in which your body will speak the truth that I am entirely yours. In fact, I know one girl told me she, the reason she doesn't sleep with boys, she said, one day I saw my dad come up to my mom and he gave her this big two-fisted hug and said, Maggie, all I want for you is one day that you can find a man who loves you as much as I love your mother. And for girl, that was case closed. She doesn't need the philosophy and theology. She, she sees the way a woman should rightly be loved. And when they can see that, they can hold out for the real thing. This is why the church calls your family the school of love. Everything we need to know about love, you learn in the family. Because, I mean, love your neighbor. I mean, it's kind of a piece of cake, right? Those people live over there. I hardly see them. Love the people you live with. That's a whole new command altogether. But I think if your kids can graduate high school, go to college, and they know how to say, I love you, I forgive you, and I'm sorry, I think you've done an awesome job of raising kids. If your kids go off to college, get married, they don't know how to say, I love you, I forgive you, and I'm sorry, I mean, good luck in that marriage one day. And so we've got to practice it. We got to live it out. And then they're much more likely to embrace it because they see not only the truth of it and the goodness of it, but the beauty of it. And so if you want resources for your family, as I had mentioned, check out our website, chastity.com. And if you want us to be able to spread this message to more people, we'd add, please ask you if you could support our family and our podcast through Patreon. The link is in the show notes. You just go to patreon.com slash Jason Everett, and you can pick a monthly gift of any amount. There's five bucks, 20 bucks, whatever. And in exchange, we'll send you free stuff, send you free t-shirts, free books, all, all kinds of stuff. So we'll give you my email in case you got any personal questions. And, and if you have questions, you can submit them on Patreon and we'll answer them either personally there uh, with an email or video to you or right here on the podcast for other people to hear. You just go to patreon.com slash Jason Everett to support this. And then the funds we get in through that, we use to edit these videos, to create more podcasts, get guests on the show and get this out to as many people as we possibly can. Because as St. John Paul II said, chastity is the sure way to happiness. So God bless you. God bless your families. And please keep us in your prayers as well.